Thanks so much for joining us. Allow me to introduce my panelists. So we've got Roxana Fias. So Roxana has served as the mayor of Newham since 2018. We heard a little bit about them earlier. They are one of four boroughs in London to offer universal primary school meals. We have got Louise Atkinson. She is the national president of the National Education Union, that's the NEU, which is the largest education trade union in Europe and their No Child Left Behind campaign calls for free school meals to be extended to all children in primary school. And we also have Professor Donald Bundy. Donald is director of the Research Consortium for School Health and Nutrition, which is an initiative of the Global School Meals Coalition. Thanks so much for joining me. Um, Louise, I would like to start with you, please. So the National Education Union it's running a high-profile campaign at the minute for universal primary school meals, not just an uplift on, on the current threshold. What is it that you see as being the, the benefits of this approach, the educational and social benefits? Thank you. So we, we've spoken a lot about what the benefits are for, for children and young people to have a good quality, nutritious meal. Um, but we very much believe at the National Education Union that that should be available to every child and every young person within skill, which is really why we're pushing for this universality in, in application for it. Um, I, you know, I'll start by saying I was a free school meal kid all the way through school. I remember queuing up to go and get my little token to go and get my free skill meals. I remember I was allowed, I think at the time, £1.10 and that didn't quite give me enough money to select what I wanted to from the canteen. Um, but as a teacher, I, I see in my skill that the difference between what children have within their packed lunches, what children have within their dinners. And I very much think that if we can offer it to all children in skill, then they can socialize together they can eat together um, as a teacher I would be much better able to teach them about good quality nutrition um, I know in my class we have lessons around an eat well plate which is a, it's a great lesson but they're cutting out little pictures and sticking them on a plate actually if we if we were providing all children with a good quality nutritious meal then I could use that as an educational tool as well in the classroom um, and we're also in entering into, well, in the midst of a cost of living crisis, we've currently got a system that's very complicated, um, it's difficult for parents to, to navigate, and children are missing out, and, you know, we, we really know the benefits of it, so we would very much like to see it offered to all children and young people. And if they can eat together and socialise together, we can teach about conversation, we can teach about using cutlery correctly, it just makes school a much more joyous place and it ensures as our campaign says that absolutely no child is left behind um, so we absolutely think that all children and young people deserve to be fed um, deserve a good quality meal within skill the skill that I work in as well you know it's it's not somewhere that you would we, we have a mixed cohort, but it's not some way that you would traditionally say that there's pockets of, you know, big poverty and big need. But a lot of the parents are, are time poor. You know, I see what goes into those kids' pack lunches, and it's not through any fault of the parents. They're working very hard, usually working multiple jobs to be able to afford to provide that food. But they just haven't got the time. They haven't got the time to provide a, a good quality, nutritious lunch. So why can't we do it at a skill? We're better placed to do it, do it for everybody, and then no child is left behind. And I think, it's, 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 you know, if all the children have the same food, it's such a leveller and puts everyone on an equal platform. I think I saw a piece of social media footage on the Food Foundation website, and it was Nick speaking. And he was talking about, at lunchtime, a particular girl running to the front of the queue so that she could get a seat at the end of the table that faced the wall so that nobody could see what was in her lunchbox. And I was like, I can't believe, you know, I can't believe that. So that, that social element, which, you know, we think about filling the stomach so they're not hungry so they can learn and, and, and just sort of live for the rest of the day. But also that social element is huge. And if young children are missing out on that, how much that must then affect their later years and into adulthood. Yeah. 
the, the, the effects are absolutely lifelong. You know, it, it is about nutrition, it is about development, but it is also emotional, it is also social, it is also psychological. And yet, they all, you know, some of the things I hear children saying to each other, it absolutely breaks my heart because I know that that, that family have got issues, whether it's around time, whether it's around money. And there's kids, kids, kids are teasing each other about what's in there. Let's give them all a really good quality meal. Let's have some good conversations around what they're eating and let's develop all children. So, thank you, Louise. Roxana, let's talk about the awesome things that happen when school meals are provided universally. So, Newham currently goes above and beyond the national entitlement, and they provide universal school meals for all pro, uh, primary school children. Can you tell us what, and this happened in 2010, right, what was it that sat behind this decision? Because it's a huge decision to make. And also, how has Newham managed to finance such a considerable investment, um, you know, given the financial pressures, pressures of councils right now? And then, Again, what are you finding? Like, what's the what has actually happened? What, how have things benefited from making that decision? So, what sits behind it are all those things that Louise um, has just set out. Um, but in addition to that, a robust evidence base that shows the absolute importance of nutritious, healthy food provided to young kids in terms of the impact that that has on um, their engagement with the school environment. But more important than all of that, it was driven by a moral purpose to respond to what at the time was a emerging crisis, uh, the precipice of austerity one, which has catastrophized now, and I'll come to what we are doing now, um, given the scale of multiple deprivation that um, was a character of Newham then and still remains a character of Newham now, but it's got worse and it is at huge scale. It is a philosophy that remains a commitment that the political class in Newham adheres to, um, but it is really hard because we spend some six million pounds per year uh, to provide the universality of free school meals, healthy, nutritious meals for 14,000 primary school kids in our borough. But I know that the demand is grown in secondary schools and we're working through actually how we're gonna afford that. Um, but where we've changed and shifted the free school meals approach since 2010 uh, and from 2018 is how we integrate that to our wider strategies as it pertains to community wealth building. And what I mean by that is we have an ecosystem of providing free school meals through a council established entity. Um, every single employee is paid the London living wage and we insist on very clear standards uh, and core principles in terms of the delivery of that contract. Uh, we are operating in a pretty much competitive market because you've got the organisation of the education system and you've got, um, you know, the vagaries of... Um, academisation that leads to some um, schools uh, across London and across the country making decisions around how they'll spend whatever budget they assign to uh, provision of food. But in the Newham context, we've largely got the majority of our schools signed up to our provision. So it's about, in terms of our current approach, um, a whole systems approach. It links to a wider ambition and strategy around food security and uh, nutrition that is required for our wider community in the context of the stark reality of 68% of our resident population living uh, in the private rented sector when you take into account household costs. The majority of our residents are defined as being living in poverty and we have too many growing 
numbers of young kids where the constraints of household finances exacerbated by 10 years of austerity and now the cost of living catastrophe it's really been felt and that's something that we're having to contend with but that whole ecosystem is something that we are advancing through our current approach to our free school mills so inclusive economy, community wealth building, but also climate emergency, um, and the educational importance of elevating young people's interest in food um, and what they can learn from food. And I say that as someone who learned nutritional science when I was at secondary school and the fascination around what you can do with food. Uh, both science, nutrition, biological, social, and then the importance of destigmatizing uh, in you know in relation to some of the stories and testimonies that you've been exposed to. You know, frankly, it's a disgrace that young kids are having to navigate that landscape, and in an age where young kids can quite readily be influenced by what they see on social media, TikTok, and then how that manifests in their interactions with, uh, with each other. Actually, we need to be part of a whole community approach around food security for all of our communities and what that potentially can unlock around our response to you know, a circular economy, climate emergency, how we grow food in school premises and across our housing estates, et cetera, et cetera. So our ambition is very much a systems-wide approach and um, fundamentally pivoting the ecosystem around this. Mm -hmm. And the so, the, so in Newham, the Universal Primary School Mills was implemented in 2010, which is 12 years ago. Are there any benefits that you've kind of tracked or noticed across that time, things that were away before that happened and things that are away now that may partly be down to that policy that, well, that came in? Certainly there's been, um, you know, you, know you, you can trace the correlation between the free school meals program and the heightened awareness around nutrition and the importance of adopting a whole schools approach and the wider school community and the interface between parents and the school around raising awareness of healthy eating and well-being. Um, there's the ongoing evidence base around uh, you know, the impact on educational outcomes, albeit um, I appreciate um, amongst the academic community uh, that is something that can be contested. I think notwithstanding the Eat for Free program, the scale of challenge that we have with regards to the social determinants of health, including issues of obesity, oral health, are still challenges that we're facing outside of us having introduced and having had a eat for free school scheme since 2010 and that's the reason why we've tied in the eat for free scheme since 2008 in, into that wider healthy food and food security strategy about lifting the health equity element of this much more and amplifying that that's that's the challenge and then donald i'm going to turn to you so in your work, it's clear that accessing a healthy hot meal at lunchtime is a major challenge for school institution systems around the world, not just here in the UK, because I know you know a lot about what other countries are doing and how they're doing it. So briefly, what can we in the UK learn from what is happen happening globally when it comes to expanding school food programs? You know, are there countries that are doing things particularly well that we can look to? Great. Well, thank you, Leila, for a chance to talk about this. I'm a researcher, not a, not a doer like the other, the other good people up here. So I, I'm just going to, and I really can't speak well and clearly about the UK as others have been able to. So I'm going to focus on the, the broader international perspective 
on this. So we, we advise, we're a research consortium that, that has been created to advise 74 countries that are seeking to rebuild their school meals and school health programs after the COVID pandemic. We have 31 of them from Africa, the African Union, European countries, the European Union. But also, I just want to emphasize the United States, China, and Cuba. These are not countries that are usually in the same grouping, to, to make the point. So they're all interested in, in this is an area that is of universal importance. Well, who's, who's doing this universally is, I think, the question you, you're asking me. In OECD countries, we're used to talking about Finland and, and Sweden and Estonia and South Korea, just to give you some examples that have been doing it for more than a decade. But we're now seeing new countries come into this, Scotland, Wales, um, we see interest now from Norway, from, from Canada, um, and from Denmark. But it's not just OECD countries. We're also seeing this in, in middle and low income countries. So, so President Lula, who was just re-elected, in his first term of office created the Zero Hunger Program in Brazil, which still today, it provides universal free meals to 40 million children every day. And India, which is the outstanding example, feeds 90 million, 90 million children every day with universal free school meals. And they, those are provided because when universal education was, in, was instigated in, in India, the, the, the people asked, well, if we're, our children are going to stay at school all day, they need to be fed. And that became a legal requirement. The Supreme Court ruled that. But I also just want to touch on, if I can have a moment to say, about the United States, not an example we often think of in this context. The United States in 2010 introduced the uh, healthy, um, uh, not, not hungry kids act. I think, that's, I think that was the title. And by 2014, this had become a national program. And its ruling was this, that if a school had a certain proportion of children eligible for school meals, then the whole school should get universal free meals. What happened? Well, for the last six years, uh, New York, Washington, DC, the big, the big urban centers have universal school meals in all their schools. And, and I'm going to highlight Texas, because we often think of Texas in a rather different way. Texas, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, all have universal school meals and have done for, a, uh, for about six years as part of this program. When COVID came, the federal decision was that all children should be, be fed. Universal school meals were made available universally throughout the state. And very interestingly, now that the, now that the COVID threat has receded, shall we say, many of those states are now still sticking with universal school meals going from a targeted program. So it's probably the case, as I speak to you now, we think there's about 400 million children fed every day in schools globally, and we think probably about a third of those benefit from universal school meals. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of, I mean, I just, I think a lot of us weren't necessarily aware of what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, and kind of makes England look like we're falling behind somewhat. Um, so very interesting. To, I mean, God, the numbers, like in India and Brazil, and you know, huge countries, and also the interest from so many countries. Um, I'd like to ask a question to the panel now. So there's, there's been a lot of focus on universal school meals at the primary school level, um, and this is what Scotland and Wales are currently focused on. But what about the older children? Should, should we not be focusing our efforts on the children from the poorest families, making sure they're fed first before we feed all children? What are your thoughts? Should I go, go ahead. I, I mean, <laughs> fundamentally, yes, I would like all children, every child and young person who's attending school and college to be given a good quality, nutritious meal. But we're thinking of targeting it at primary school for a, a couple of reasons. Um, partly because they've kind of got the infrastructures there already, because they're already providing some universal meals up, up to a certain age group. Um, so there is that element to it there. 
there is also the element, there's a, a growing body of evidence that actually it's families with younger children that are being more impacted by the cost of living crisis and the falling into poverty as well. But for me as a teacher and parent as well, it's about forming those good habits early on. You know, I, 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 as I say, I don't want to detract from the fact I'd love all children. Every child deserves a good quality meal, but actually to target a primary school, to start a primary school, it means that we're able to, to form those good habits around nutrition, to educate those children young people, and then they take that on into their future education and their future lifetime as well. And, and I would say what puts that all at risk is stopping at secondary school level and um, not maintaining um, as part of our whole systems approach and that early preventative approach, which we all know work so much better, it then just fractures the sustainability of that and you get young kids at secondary school um, losing out uh, from the benefit, uh, but also the money that you've invested from that primary age cohort, in essence, potentially could go to waste or it could be reversed. The other point that I would raise is, and this is anecdotal, but we're going to be exploring this further, but one of the things um, that we've picked up, and this be has been through a strand of work um, under the auspices of our Youth Safety Board, the importance of universality when it comes to food in the context of secondary school kids, many of whom in the Newham context come from low-income households, how that could be a mitigation against some young kids with vulnerabilities being drawn into activities of exploitation. Um, so that's an important area for us that we also want to mitigate against. But again, it's part of that. How do we, as part of our place-based approach to ensuring that Newham becomes a healthy place for everyone where we're addressing all of those social determinants, poverty, you know, income insecurity that lead to health inequity and that was experienced and demonstrated at such devastating effect during COVID-19 where we were amongst, well, for a period, we had the highest level of um, deprivation, um, de deprivation linked um, more mortality rates, uh, which was pretty devastating for community during the first lockdown, but it just really brought into ha um, sharp focus the exposure and risks and vulnerabilities that poverty causes, and you know we've we've sustained our infrastructure uh, from what we've put in place um, more broadly into the community through our new and food alliance, which in essence. As part of that wider ecosystem I referred to earlier, we have some 150 voluntary sector organisations and each week we distribute some 50 tonnes of food free to families, over 30,000 families each week, 50 tonnes of which 30 tonnes comprise of surplus food and 30, uh, 20 tonnes drawn from other sources, we're the largest local authority um, collaborator with the Felix Project, which works with local authorities on surplus food and, um, you know, how you can circulate that into your locality. Um, and the amount of money that we're enabling families that are hard-pressed, particularly now, or even more so now, is insurmountable, combined with the £500 per child per family for every single child that we feed at primary school. And if you can just imagine the economic impact as well as the health impact if we were able to afford to extend it onto secondary school pupils. Um, I wonder if we have, do we have time for quick elevator pitches? We don't, no, it's the end of class. Thank you so much, <laughs> panelists. Um, really wonderful. <laughs>